The Ocracoke Lighthouse celebrated its 200th anniversary with an event that showcases its rich history. You can also go inside the lighthouse and see some original structure like the staircase that dates all the way back to the late 1800s. We spoke with a park ranger about the event, the lighthouse and some other fun facts that she had to share. So let's check it out. My name is Ranger Alyssa. Uh, I'm an interpretive ranger here at Cape Hatteras National Seashore. Uh, last, se uh, last year I worked at the Ocracoke Lighthouse and uh, this year I work at the Cape Hatteras Lighthouse. So I get to kind of bounce back and forth, which is, which is really great. But we just uh, wrapped up our 200th celebration for the Ocracoke Light Station. It was a really great uh, ceremony we had, um, almost 500 people here, uh, and it's just been a, a monumental event that we've been planning for uh, many months now. Um, so just celebrating 200 years of uh, the light station, the lighthouse, the keeper's quarters. Um, it is still in use today. It's still considered an active aid to navigation, which is really incredible. Uh, so the National Park Service, we manage and maintain the structures here, but uh, since it still is an active aid, the Coast Guard is actually maintains the light, which is why they were here today as well. So it uh, stands at 75 feet tall. Uh, there is a fourth order Fresnel lens still up at the top that was installed in 1899, and it's still there today, still shines about 14 miles out to sea. Yeah, you know, we get people from near and far. We get people that return year after year. It's really incredible to see. Um, just being here today, I've met so many people from last season and the season before uh, that remembered me and I remembered them. So um, it really is such a great community and the people that do come on their family vacations, uh, they this place really holds a, a special place in their hearts, I, I feel. It was a, a big buildup. Uh, we had many communi community mem members that were part of the planning committee, um, along with uh, partner organizations like Outer Banks Forever, um, the Outer Banks Lighthouse Society, uh, and, and also people from the county as well. I guess there, there's 87 stairs up to the top, but um, it's interesting to know that the staircase that is in there now uh, is actually not the original staircase. So it used to be anchored against the wall. So when you walk into the Ocracoke Lighthouse, you can still see uh, those patches of cement that, that were what anchored the original stairs. You know, we preserve these lighthouses because we're really preserving that story in our history where we depended on uh, ships and maritime travel. Uh, but here on Ocracoke Island, we aren't preserving a story of what was, but we are uh, preserving a story that still is. So uh, almost everybody here today used uh, maritime travel to get here. Uh, so it is still a, a lifeline of the island. The Alligator River National Wildlife Refuge has some beautiful hiking trails right behind me, but there are some animals that you need to be wary of. Its visitor center is just 10 minutes away with a very interactive museum for you to look at. We were able to speak with a park ranger today about her job and her favorite parts of this area. Let's check it out. I'm Sarah Toner. I'm a wildlife refuge specialist with Alligator River National Wildlife Refuge. We have a lot of land to explore. We have more than 150,000 acres and miles of roads, hiking trails um, to hike, bike, and drive on. We have a wonderful visitor center located on Manio on Roanoke Island. The visitor center has environmental education exhibits with videos of animal, videos of the refuges, and uh, information about the history and wildlife on our refuge. I think my favorite part is the bird life. I'm really interested in birds and we have some really gorgeous bright yellow prothonotary warblers, big great blue herons in the canals. It's lovely. I work in a variety of refuge program areas from maintenance and biology to outreach and education. 
We get both uh, lots of tourists visiting the area as well as locals who oftentimes in the evenings, locals will take a drive on the wildlife drive and compete to see who can see the most bears in an evening. So we have trails located at our visitor center on Roanoke Island, and then the refuge itself is located on mainland Dare about 15 minutes away. I've been interested in birds and biology since I was a child, and so working for the National Wildlife Refuge System has been a dream of mine, and I was very fortunate to get this position after I graduated college. My favorite bird is a boreal chickadee, which is not found around here, but it's found back home in Michigan where I grew up. Refuge is open from dawn to dusk for hiking, biking, and walking, for wildlife observation and photography, and getting out and experiencing nature. The Body Island Lighthouse in Nags Head has a lot to offer with its rich history and wildlife that is right by its boardwalk. All of this attracts over 2 million tourists per year. We spoke with park ranger Tom Avery about his job and got to learn some more fun facts about the area. Let's take a look. My name is Thomas Avery and I am the supervisory park ranger for interpretation of the Body Island District of Cape Hatteras National Seashore. There's a lot of history, I um, don't know necessarily where to start, but I guess I'll start with uh, this lighthouse, which is actually the third Body Island lighthouse of the area. Construction started in 1871, uh, was completed in 1872, and first lit on October 1st of that year, uh, and has been a shining beacon ever since. You know, we get a wide variety of questions. Uh, one of the popular questions is kind of, well, has it been moved? Um, it's kind of a misconception between us and, and the Cape Hatteras Lighthouse. Uh, a lot of folks will see that it's kind of not on the shoreline uh, and assume that it's been moved, but it's actually been in the same spot for a little over 150 years. It's a little bit different because we can see people on the grounds. We may not get everybody that comes into the actual visitor center itself. Uh, Cape Hatteras National Seashore uh, last year in uh, 2022, uh, we saw about 2.85 million visitors for the seashore, give or take. Uh, now that's not everybody that's going to be coming out to the lighthouse, but uh, for the, the seashore itself, um, that's the visitation. So The visitor center is in what is the historic double keepers quarters. Uh, so that's where the lighthouse keepers would have actually have lived. Uh, and then the lighthouse and the little structure in front of that it was kind of more where they worked but inside uh, we have a contact station you can ask uh, as many questions as you like as far as whoever is back behind the um, visitor center desk and then also on the uh, the other side there is a gift shop uh, to be able to kind of purchase those souvenirs uh, and then during uh, kind of Basically, from late April through early October, the lighthouse is uh, open for climbing. Uh, climb tickets are available on recreation.gov, so they're online ticket sales. They are timed tickets, but uh, climbing the lighthouse is an opportunity as well. District Interpretive Ranger, I'm kind of uh, in charge of that visitor center operations and kind of giving programs um, and making sure that the lighthouse, like I said, when it was open for climbing, uh, that runs smoothly, but we also have other programs as far as uh, kind of the traditional ranger talks. Uh, we do crabbing with a ranger, kayaking with a ranger, um, and those sorts of things, and so uh, I make sure that that's running smoothly. Coming out of high school, my first uh, you know, thoughts was I actually wanted to be an architect. Uh, and then as I went to kind of schooling for that, I decided I did not want to be an architect. Uh, and I ended up getting a history degree. And uh, interesting enough, as I was getting my history degree, the very next question everybody would ask after, you know, what are you studying is, oh, so you want to be a teacher? And then I would always jokingly say, no, I want to go play in the woods and get paid for it. And then I get some odd uh, kind of looks and then explain the park service uh, and the ability to be able to kind of come out to these wonderful places that, uh, that we have and be able to educate folks, but not necessarily in a four-walled classroom setting, uh, more in a, in a setting like this. So. A lot of folks maybe will ask how many bricks. Uh, I like to say that one million bricks were ordered. Uh, they were fired in Baltimore um, and came and that, uh, that got the, the lighthouse built, um, but also some of the bricks were used in the, uh, the keeper's quarters as well. So we don't know the exact number, uh, but just under one million bricks uh, in the lighthouse that we have. Uh, and then also from, from the ground all the way to the very top of the lightning rod, it's 167 feet and eight inches uh, tall. So a pretty, pretty large structure there. Yeah, we do have snakes in the area. Um, Body Island sometimes gets uh, notorious uh, for, for the amount of rattlesnakes that we have. So we do have cane break rattlesnakes. Um, but other animals, uh, we have tons of different uh, birds, um, especially just depends on what type of the year you're here. Um, but as far as other mammals, uh, we have white-tailed deer, uh, we can have raccoon, uh, fox, coyote. Um, and then as far as the, the seashore, we're a major uh, loggerhead uh, sea turtle nesting area. We have other uh, sea turtles as well, um, but I would say like 90% of the nests that we have on the seashore uh, are loggerhead sea turtles, and, and so uh, we enjoy that little fact as well. Come see me. Uh, you know, we're definitely uh, out here. 
Uh, we, we enjoy talking with everybody. Um, I think it's a wonderful spot. We're so close to, uh, to Nags Head, Kitty Hawk, Kittle of the Hills. Um, but when you come out to the lighthouse, you kind of take a little drive through uh, some, some pine forest and get out here and you feel so far removed, even though you're actually uh, really close and it's really accessible. So. If you have ever seen a North Carolina postcard, you have probably seen this lighthouse behind me. The Cape Hatteras Lighthouse is known for how tall it is along with the infamous pattern that is around it. Park Ranger Jonathan Polk told us a little bit about what makes it so special, some of his favorite fun facts and why he believes that it is a staple in the state of North Carolina. Let's take a look. I'm Ranger Jonathan Polk, uh, park ranger here at Cape Hatteras National Seashore, uh, and I oversee the Interpretation and Education Division uh, for the seashore here. So we're here at the Cape Hatteras Lighthouse today. Um, this one is kind of the lighthouse of all lighthouses, if you will. It's the tallest lighthouse, not just on the Outer Banks of North Carolina. See, it's the tallest one in uh, the United States and all of North America. Uh, it's 198 and a half feet tall um, from the ground level up to the top of the lightning rod up there. Uh, so it is the tallest one and um, it does protect one of the arguably some of the most dangerous areas, not just here in North Carolina, but in, along the entire Atlantic seaboard here in the Atlantic Ocean. So uh, with the uh, convergence of currents out here with the Gulf Stream and the Labrador currents, they meet right here off of Cape Hatteras, not far from where we're at today. Um, because of those currents and the sandbars and everything that are forming out there, um, it's, a, it's a really dangerous place, even today, even with all the technology and everything that we have. So um, that's, that's why the Cape Hatteras Lighthouse here had to be as tall as it is, and that's why it is uh, so significant. I mentioned that the height of it, the, the, being the tallest one, and it really was built to kind of set that example uh, for lighthouses in the United States. Um, and uh, that, that's, that's a lot of, that's a, that's a great story to tell. Um, another big thing with the lighthouse here was that this lighthouse was actually relocated uh, in 1999. It used to stand about a half a mile away from where we're at today, a lot closer to the ocean. Uh, being that we're on a barrier island, um, the island's constantly changing and the shoreline was getting closer and closer. Um, so the decision was made to actually pick the lighthouse up and move it to a safer spot where it's at, at now. Um, so that was a pretty monumental occasion. Um, there was a lot of engineering involved. Um, a lot of planning and essentially kind of what happened was the workers went in, they, they dug down around the original foundation of the lighthouse, they uh, cut it from its original foundation um, and then it used these large hydraulic jacks underneath the lighthouse to lift the lighthouse up, um, jacked it up about six feet in the air and then built a track system underneath it, it looked like big railroad tracks that the lighthouse sat on um, and then with rollers that were between the tracks and the lighthouse uh, they were able to use hydraulic push jacks and push the lighthouse along those tracks just a little bit at a time um, for the entire half a mile that it moved. It is still operational. Um, the light at the top is maintained by the Coast Guard. The Coast Guard still sees this as, or he still uses it as an active aid to navigation. And because of that, the area where we're at, because of the constant shifting of sands and, and the currents and everything, um, there still is a need for it um, here in the area, even with GPS and everything that we use now. So. Um, it is still operational, comes on every single night. It's all fully automated now. Um, another common question we get right now is, uh, when, when is it gonna be able to reopen kind of for climbing, uh, for, for viewing and everything? So uh, currently it is closed to climbing um, because we are getting ready for a pretty big restoration and repair project to the lighthouse. Um, it is over 150 years old now, so it, it looks good um, uh, at, at first glance, but there's a lot of work that has to happen when it's uh, that old of a structure. So um, the Park Service is dedicated to doing that restoration, and that's something we're in the, the process of planning right now. Um, and we're hopeful that work will start uh, soon, later this year even. Um, and it, it could take some time. I mean, it's a big project. Um, so um, it's gonna take some time before we get it reopened, but we're definitely excited to eventually get it back open uh, once all that work's completed. So it's gonna be in, in really good shape and safe for, for folks to come and enjoy. Yeah, there's quite a good bit still um, original fabric, if you will, um, for the lighthouse. Um, most of the, uh, the granite and the bricks and things that you see is all still original 
to the lighthouse. Um, a lot of the metalwork in there is still original. Some of it has been repaired over the years. Things like up at the balcony and, and the stairs uh, have been repaired uh, over the years. Um, the light at the top is not an, the original lens that used to be in there. Originally, it would have been a first order Fresnel lens, uh, which is similar to uh, the lens that's at the Body Island Lighthouse. Um, but that first order for Nell lens has been removed. Um, it's uh, normally on display at a museum in the local area here. Um, that museum's also closed for renovations right now. But uh, so the light is a, a newer light, but we are, as part of the restoration project, the light is going to be getting addressed. So we're looking at possibly putting a replica for Nell lens back in there. Uh, when that restoration takes place. I mean, when folks come to the Outer Banks, uh, they think Cape Hatteras. I mean, that, that's what folks are thinking of. The Cape Hatteras Lighthouse, I like, to, I like to think, is the most iconic lighthouse of them all. Um, I've had a lot of people tell me from all over the country when they visit that, um, like, if they come and, and when they think of lighthouses, like, Cape Hatteras is the first one that comes to mind. That black and white spiral pattern that you see, that's, the, that's what people see when they think lighthouses. And that's what the lighthouse service was really kind of going going for when they built this lighthouse. It was built to uh, be that example of what lighthouses were meant to be. With all the ornamentation that you see in the metalwork at the top, on the stairs inside, um, things like that with the marble floors that are in there. Um, I mean, they really wanted to set that example. They wanted to say, okay, Cape Hatteras is going to, it's protecting the, the most dangerous area out there. It needs to be the best. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I think that's what, what folks see and, and feel. So uh, a lot of folks don't feel like a, a trip to the Outer Banks is complete until they've come and at least stood here at the base of the lighthouse and, and kind of taken it all in. For, gosh, for me personally, there, there's so much about the lighthouse itself and the area that, that I connect with. Uh, I, I'm originally from Eastern North Carolina. I've been coming out here my entire life and I've, I've been fortunate enough to be out here with the Park Service in different capacities for a number of years now. Um, and so um, I think some of what we've already talked about, the lighthouse just being the largest one, the iconic one, protecting the, the um, the, the dangerous landscape that it is out here uh, certainly resonates with me, but I think also the story of the ever-changing barrier islands. Um, I mean, being that we're on a barrier island out here, things are changing all the time when we see uh, storms and I mean, really anything that will affect that change. And uh, the lighthouse being relocated, that story right there is just a true testament to what life on a barrier island entails. You have to be able to kind of go with the flow on the barrier island. Things are not going to be permanent um, on, a, on the landscape that, it, that is the Outer Banks. And uh, I think the Cape Hatteras Lighthouse is just a true testament to that. The Currituck Beach Lighthouse has over 200 steps that will lead you to a beautiful view of the Outer Banks as well as an experience you will never forget. They also have original houses of the lightkeepers here as well as a museum you can check out. We spoke with one of the site managers to learn a little bit more facts about the area, so let's see. Megan Agresto, site manager of the Currituck Beach Lighthouse. This is a beautiful lighthouse built sort of in the heyday of beautiful American lighthouses. So we're first illuminated in 1875. You'll see that uh, this is unpainted brick. A lot of people forget that Body and Hatteras and Cape Lookout are also brick because they're painted, but be, we're unpainted so that in the daytime we're distinguishable from other lighthouses nearby. And so if you had a light list while you were navigating at sea, you'd be like, okay, red brick lighthouse, I must be at Currituck, okay, better not get too close. We've got shoals, we have no deep water, and this is the graveyard of the Atlantic. The last thing we want to do is run ashore. So. That's what we say in the daytime with our red brick and in the nighttime, at least when we were an oil burning lighthouse, which is between 1875 and 1933, we had to create a flash pattern when every lighthouse is burning oil. So everybody's going to look the same at night. You had to use what you had to create a flash that makes you distinct. Lights need to be high enough above sea level to shine far, but because the Outer Banks are so flat, we had to be tall. We, the Currituck Beach Lighthouse. The engineers of the lighthouse establishment used the benefit of being tall to create or to use a crank system of weights and pulleys to allow the pulling or the falling with gravity of a weight to move a drum which moved a carriage which had three red covered flash panels which meant that if you were a mariner in let's say 1876 and you weren't moving at sea you would have seen 
a red light approaching you and then cross you for five seconds. And then as it passed, you would have just seen the white light of the shining through our first order Fresnel lens for 85 seconds. Again, you would have consulted your light list and be like, okay, I know where I am. Uh, I mentioned the Fresnel lens because we're one of, I think, 13 lighthouses in America that continues to be an active public aid to navigation with the use of a first order Fresnel lens, which is the largest of the seven orders of the Fresnel lens. So that's pretty cool. It continues to be owned by the United States of America and used by the Coast Guard. Well, since 1933, we've had a flashing light. So that's much easier to distinguish. Everybody at this point has a different flash pattern. So we're three seconds on and 17 off. There were a variety of ways to, to make a light distinct at night. A lot of people are like, why is this lighthouse built in the woods? Which it wasn't, it was built on the beach. And in fact, our keeper's house here, which was built as a duplex for three families, is facing the Currituck Sound, because really that's where life was, right? In 1875, there was no chapel here, there was no post office here, there was no school here, but it was still a land-based lighthouse. So a lot of people were like, please let me serve at this lighthouse. So you would go, you would sail across the Currituck Sound for any of your needs. And by 1895 and 1896, we have a post office and a school and a chapel. So that really makes this a coveted light station. The dunes were created to protect the infrastructure that was built a long time of the, along the period of time of the Wright Brothers Memorial, getting rid of the cattle along the Outer Banks, which is something we used to have out here. That allowed for shrubbery to turn into trees, to turn into what looks like a maritime forest around us. We've never, this lighthouse has never been moved. This keeper's house has never been moved. Actually, with regard to the keeper's house, we're the only keeper's house of this style left in America. Also, our brick walkway is planetarily unique. You will not find a walkway like this with the curbs at any lighthouse because we've got enough space for it. And because, of course, this 1875, this is finished. 1876, the house is finished. That's 100 years after 1776. And this is a federal site. And it is my guess that there is a lot of intentionality about the details of the Victorian stick style and just how lovely this site is with the walkway and the lens and the first order house based on the timing of when the tower was built. But there are other things to do. We do have three museums just south of us in the historic Kerala Park. So that really brings a lot of people to enjoy this area about our sweet little museum shop, which is an original lighthouse keeper's house, but it was built in the Kuratak Sound on an island in the Kuratak Sound. From the time we opened in mid-March through December 1st, which is our birthday, every day nine to five, weather permitting, we say. So that means we're open almost all the time, except for, for major storms, a northeast wind blowing rain into the lighthouse and thunder. We don't let people climb because we're the tallest metal toppest building around. We do not want anyone getting shocked. People pay to climb. They do have to sign a waiver saying we understand that there is some risk in climbing a building. There's 220 steps to the top. 221 if you count one down and then have to go back out it. But there's nine landings. That's the thing about this lighthouse, as I talked about, it's like a first order lighthouse, not just because of the size and beauty of the lens, but because there's a lot of architectural effort put into it. So instead of just, but instead of just having spiral steps to get to a utilitarian aid to navigation, these steps are only about 22 at a time and then you have a break and all of the landings are a different size, which means all that metal is cast separately all of which cost the United States of America a lot of money to make as wide open. And people are like, oh, it's an open stairs, I'm scared. I'm like, no, you're not scared. You're there to appreciate that marble floor and the lightness of the tower and how you could build a lighthouse on sand and have it be so stable. So there's a lot to appreciate, Courtney, while you're on your way up. The Aviation Heritage Foundation in Havelock has so much history here, including the airplane behind me that was flown in Vietnam. It has authentic marine uniforms as well as other uniforms. There's even an airplane simulator and more. Let's learn some history and see how well I can fly an airplane. The Havelock Tourist and Event Center was opened in 2002. And so we celebrated 20 years in December. Started with the city commissioners and the mayor worked together to be able to get this facility opened. And uh, we've had numerous events here, but our main thing is our aviation exhibits that are here. 
Eastern Carolina Aviation Heritage Foundation that oversees our exhibits. Actually, we've just gotten a new simulator, which is a Harrier simulator that we want everybody to come out and see. Okay, behind me is our brand new Aviate, basically full systems simulator that was built for us. I mean, you can get in there and you can look like you're flying outside just like you was in the airplane, or you can be in another airplane beside you looking down at yourself. Our center also is a visitor center, so it is great to see people from all over the country, not just here in North Carolina, but people come visit this area. With the Cherry Point Marine Corps base being so close, we have families that come in and explore the, the facility, and it's just great to see people that come back that were stationed here and talk about what they actually remember about Havelock and about their experiences over at Cherry Point. So I actually uh, am in charge of the facility. The maintenance part, making sure I do have some full-time staff that helps me with that. Uh, but we worry about that part of it, and then we make sure that the exhibits, the visitors are looked after. Our Havelock Chamber of Commerce, during the week, they, are, they help us with the visitors. So they're the ones that greet the visitors for us, work with them, and show them around the exhibits and all of that. And then on Saturdays, I have part-time staff that come in and help us with that also. So. Well, we work on our summer camp, which is coming up very soon, and it's going to be great. And this year was tough because we have 55 uh, campers that we accepted, but we had 80-some applicants. So we had to weed through and get recommendations from the teachers and the parents and the, and the kids wrote letters and all. And, and our goal is to get them excited about engineering and about aviation. So that's going to be a neat camp. So I work with that, and then we have our fly-in coming up, which is... Uh, August the 18th, so I work along with that, and, and Pam is a real brains behind this the show that uh, she just ever so often pushes me out front to talk about it, but she's the brains. And then we do a little function in the in the fall, which is really fun, and, and it's our fall event, but what we do is we ask the members of the ECAF to come in and enjoy an evening with us, and then we challenge them to do what the kids did in summer camp. So one year it was egg drops. So the, they had to do just what the kids did, and that's figure out what kind of materials work the best, get on a lift and get up high and drop the eggs and see how many break and how many don't. And it's, it's just so much fun to watch the adult. Of course, we compress it. We only give them an hour or so as opposed to a week to build up to it. But, but it's a lot of fun to do that. Uh, and then we have a gala in February. We have a guest speaker. We've had the, uh, the head civilian from the Fleet Readiness Center East on Cherry Point. Uh, we've had stunt pilots, we've had all kinds of different people come in and talk to us about what they do that has to do with either aviation or engineering. And people come into that and we have a nice meal, usually about 400 or so people attend that. So it's a, it's a big deal. And we do it right here in the Tourist Event Center, which is a great venue for us. We've been very fortunate. Talk about this special thing behind you. Let's talk about that. That is a, a, a CH-46. This particular one is an HH-46 because it was configured to be a Pedro, the search and rescue aircraft for this area. And in my last tour at Cherry Point, I got to fly Pedro, which was, which was fun. That was kind of back in ancient history. Um, I was here for Hurricane Floyd, so uh, I remember going up to Greenville and, and getting fuel when we were rescuing people, but then after a while, the water was four feet up in the terminal at the Greenville Airport, so we couldn't. We had to bring in trucks and, and get them on the road so we could refuel. But it was great for that. And, uh, and before that, I flew it as a combat aircraft, flew it in Vietnam, and, uh, and then for the next 30 odd years after that. So it's just a great aircraft. Carry troops, rescue people, um, do insertions, do all kinds of stuff. So a really versatile aircraft that has now been replaced by the Osprey, the V-22. So this is a relic, kind of like some of us that flew it. We go all the way back to the Wright brothers and talk about what they did and how brave it was and how many times they failed. And then they just kept pushing on, like Edison or all the great inventors. And they kept pushing on and really developed something that now we can't live without. And, and helicopters like this, uh, Vietnam, we would, we would usually be at the site of where the person was wounded within maybe 30 minutes or, or an hour. 
and we save so many limbs and so many lives by being able to get them to a doctor quickly as opposed to you look back in the Civil War and if you got shot in the leg, you're probably gonna lose your leg. And even in World War II, if you got injured, it was gonna take so long to get you to the back lines where the medical people were. They always had corpsmen, and thank God for that because they're really great. But, but to get them back to real surgical abilities is, is a big thing, and that's what the helicopters, one of the things they did for us. Eastern Carolina Aviation Heritage Foundation is sponsoring a camp that starts on July the 24th through the 28th. It's a half day camp. It is entitled Go the Distance and uh, we'll have 55 fourth, a rising fourth, fifth and sixth graders here with local teachers and engineers from FRC East and volunteers. It's gonna be a great camp and we're really looking forward to it. And then in August, on August the 18th, we have a free family night. It's, uh, we, it's our STEM night where we'll have different booths with STEM activities. All of it's interactive, so all the kids will get to be able to come out and explore. We'll have our H46 open for the kids to go inside of, and so it's just going to be a great night. It's free. We will have some door prizes and some giveaways, and the Havelock Police Department will be here with school supplies. So I want to invite everyone to come. It starts at 5 and it ends at 8. We're out here in beautiful Oriental, North Carolina, and it is not every day that you get to learn how to drive a boat on these gorgeous waters out here in Pamlico County. Captain Jim Edwards teaches me the importance and the specifics about being behind the wheel of a boat, so let's check it out. Stern Boating, we are a, a full service boating center. We have everything from kayaks to large sailboats, power boats, uh, small power boats. We have uh, a trawler uh, that you can do overnight trips on. Some of the bigger sailboats you can do overnight trips. And we also have a summer day camp for kids. We actually started just as a youth program. And we started as a sailing program for kids uh, ages 6 to 15. And that grew to include, as we added more boats for them, we added bigger boats and we ended up adding more adult lessons. So now we actually have adult sailing lessons as well. And all of the boats we have, we use for rentals and charters. Uh, well, the day camp is a big one. Um, we also offer group programs. We have a lot of um, scouts that come, um, both girls and boys. We've had Girl Scouts come, we've had schools come, uh, and we do, we work with kayaks as well as teach sailing uh, for the kids there. And then the bigger ones, probably that a lot of people don't know about is we also do other programs. Uh, for instance, we've got a college regatta coming this weekend. Uh, our college regatta is, we're hosting NC State's uh, regional college regatta, and we do that every year. We've got 18 different colleges coming this year. Uh, they'll be racing out on, in front of Lumac Park on Saturday and Sunday, uh, open to the public. You can come to the park and watch them. They'll start racing about 10 o'clock on Saturday. Uh, Saturday night we have a barbecue dinner. You can meet some of the sailors and we've got some live music here that you can come and enjoy and then more racing on Sunday. Uh, we have kids uh, all ages and all ability levels. Some of them never sailed before and we put them on, on size appropriate boats. So we have uh, Opti's which are for the little ones. We have lasers and we have FJ's. And so we put them on size appropriate boats and start from the very basics and go all the way up. So we can work with ones, like I said, who have never sailed before as well as ones that are racing. Uh, some of our counselors actually raced in, at the collegiate level. So we can teach it all, uh, all skills. Oh goodness, I've been around boats for longer than I'd like to say, probably 50 years. And I grew up sailing with my father. We did some racing. Uh, I was, went to a local camp here and then started the program, uh, our sailing school, in actually in 1998 in Florida. And we moved here in 2004. And we kind of brought it back here. And I've been around boats, been a captain for more years than I'd like to say. Uh, and again, everything from sailboats to power boats to trawlers. Oh goodness, it's, it's the, known as the sailing capital of North Carolina. Um, very nice, calm, laid back, super nice people. I mean, you, you can't go wrong. You can always ask for help, and if you don't know where you're going, people will tell you, you know, give you directions or help you out and give you suggestions. Uh, so it's just a really nice small town, uh, laid back, easy going, and friendly. What's your favorite part about getting to do the boating and the camp? 
just all the different people get, get a chance to see people and, and give them an experience that they may not normally get uh, whether it's spending the night on the boat for the first time or, or going to Cape Lookout or you know just a kid who turns around and says you know when you ask him what he learned he said I just learned I love that sail and that's that's special Preconceived notions about boating, I would say in, in many cases, I think a lot of people think it's a lot harder than it is, whether it be you know, driving a power boat or learning how to sail. It's just a matter of getting out there and doing it and trying it and spending more time on the water. A lot of people think that they can you know, come in and do it right away, which is not always the case, but there again, you, know, you can't learn how to play a violin in a day. So once you put some more time into it, it becomes a lifelong experience and it doesn't make any difference how old you are. Beach State Park in Onslow County where they have a ferry that will take you to beautiful Bear Island. They also offer activities such as their hiking trails, canoeing and kayaking. So let's check it out. I'm Sarah Kendrick. I'm the park superintendent at Hammocks Beach State Park. So I have been a park ranger for 20 years. Um, it was during my college years that I decided to become a park ranger. I worked here at Hammocks Beach State Park as a seasonal in the concession stand for two summers and I really fell in love with the place. Um, decided to change my major and go into resource management and become a park ranger. Um, I really love the coast. I grew up in Jacksonville. I grew up on the coast so my family, you know, we went to the beach every weekend. Um, I really enjoy protecting the wildlife and the resources along the coast and that's what drew me to this area. So we are a very unique state park in North Carolina. We have multiple islands that make up all of the park. Um, we also have about 300 acres here on the mainland. Our main attraction is Bear Island, which most people come to Hammocks Beach to see. They usually take the ferry over to the island and our ferry runs from April through October. Um, but you can also take your own boat over there or you can canoe, kayak, stand up paddleboard. Um, there's also lots of vendors in the area that can take you over as well. Sure, so we like to tell people to come into the visitor center first. Um, we can give you lots of information in the visitor center. Um, if it's during the ferry season, definitely take a ride over on the ferry. Even if you just ride over to the island and ride back, that's even still fun. Uh, you can take the ferry over first thing in the morning and stay all day and come back anytime you want until the ferry, last ferry of the day. You're welcome to go camping on Bear Island as long as you have a camping permit. So that's a very, uh, it's an adventure to go camping on the island. It's very primitive, so be prepared for that. Uh, we also have about three miles of hiking trails that you can hike through here on the mainland. Sure, we have about three miles of hiking trails. They're fairly easy to hike. Um, they go through the forested area here on the mainland in Swansboro. So we get a lot of folks that come into the park that have lived here all their lives and they've never been to Hammock Beach State Park. We're at the end of Hammock Beach Road. They've just never turned down this road and come all the way to the end. So we like to showcase uh, bear Island. We also like to showcase the other islands we own, Huggins Island, Jones Island, and Dudley Island. Um, but we also have a lot of stuff happening here on the mainland as well. Lots of new construction. Uh, we just acquired this property in 2015. So we've got a new mainland campground coming along and we also have an event center of an event space that is being reconstructed at this point. Uh, Bear Island is one of the last undeveloped beaches in North Carolina. There's only very few uh, areas where there's no uh, houses on these coastal areas and we are one of the last few. So we want people to go over to Bear Island and appreciate the resource and appreciate the beautiful sand we have and the beautiful water and be able to look for shells and do fun things on the beach. 